I'd like to thank Sages for allowing me to present the topic of gastric electrical stimulation and pyloroplasty, how I do it. I never thought after my residency at Texas Tech in Lubbock that I would dedicate now 50% of my practice to gastroparesis. I have nothing to disclose. I wanted to start with patient selection because I feel like screening is, a, that success is a direct reflection of proper screening. So as e equally as important as technique, I feel like is screening. I know we just talked about this, but here are some of the uh, key selection criteria. The etiology can be either idiopathic or diabetic gastroparesis. I do feel like it's important to, to find the cause of non-diabetic gastroparesis because oftentimes the symptoms of say POTS or uh, autoimmune disorders uh, become overwhelming and having a cause for this sometimes helps alleviate some of the burden on the patient. In addition, their primary symptoms should be nausea and vomiting and may often be present for greater than six months. Uh, medical therapy should be, they should have failed or be intolerant to a prokinetic and an antiemetic therapy. The gastric emptying study will show retention of 50% at two hours or greater than 6% at four hours is considered abnormal. There is, however, one payer in uh, Texas that considers greater than 10% abnormal. Also important is that they be off prokinetics for three days prior to their gastric emptying study. This ensures that they have an accurate test, but also that, they, that the result ends up in maximal delay for the patient. They should have failed diet modification. They will have an uh, EGD to rule out ulcers or mechanical obstruction. This eliminates those as causes for the gastroparesis and the symptoms. They must, of course, be a viable surgical candidate and rule out psychological causes for their vomiting, but also be willing to decrease the amount of narcotics that they use. So here's a pictorial of that uh, delay, uh, excuse me, of that uh, algorithm. And here is my uh, alternative algorithm. So in patients that don't follow the exact uh, pathway, so first of all, for patients who fail diet, diet modification, they're evaluated with a pre-albumin. If their pre-albumin is too low, then I worry about their ability to have the, enough nutrition to heal. So I'd consider a preoperative digenostomy too. Oftentimes this is only needed for six months or less, or uh, in order to improve their nutrition enough to have surgery. Secondly, if they don't meet criteria because they have atypical symptoms, but they do have an abnormal gastric emptying study, then I would consider doing a temporary stimulator to test their response. And we'll talk about that in just one second. Uh, thirdly, if they have a normal emptying study, but they have typical gastroparesis symptoms, with the primary complaint being nausea and vomiting, I would also consider a temporary stimulator. And if no response to it, then try pyloric Botox. And finally, if they have severe emptying, meaning they have greater than 30% empty uh, retention at four hours, then I would do concomitant gastric stimulator and pyloroplasty. The benefit of the temporary stimulation is that it, uh, the leads are implanted in the stomach endoscopically. They're cardiac leads, so they're extra long. They come out of the nose and then are connected to the battery. It stays in place while the patient lives their life for three to five days and assesses their response to therapy. If they have symptom improvement, that indicates that they would also respond to the gastric stimulator if it were implanted. This gives us the opportunity to petition the insurance companies for this atypical presentation that the patient will in fact respond to therapy. So what's the surgical procedure? Options for placement can be open, laparoscopic, or robotic. Uh, open placement utilizes an upper midline incision, and under direct visualization, the stomach can be accessed and the leads can be put into place. A pocket is made on the right side of the incision. The leads are then tunneled into this pocket. The pocket and the incision are then closed. Uh, the advantage of this is having direct access to the stomach through a fairly small incision. However, the disadvantage is having to reaccess the stomach at a later point in time puts the lead and the battery at risk. Laparoscopic and robotic placements are very similar. The benefit of robotic placement, however, is having the high definition visualization and the improved dexterity for suturing. Both of those will provide the patient with improved uh, patient uh, return to work and reduced recovery compared to open. 
Patient positioning is supine. They are placed in reverse Trendelenburg with their arms tucked and a footboard in place to avoid sliding. In addition, we, I've asked that they have adequate space at the head of the bed for access for endoscopy. This includes having no esophageal probes or nasogastric tubes, or at least have them removed prior to endoscopy. Here is the typical port placement for robotic gastric stimulator placement. The three ports are placed first super umbilically, then at each midclavicular line. There's also a one 10 millimeter air seal port that will later be used to uh, create a pocket. The air seal port has the benefit of maintaining a pneumoperitoneum. It will also be the access point for the leads and the assistant. Once the leads are in place, the chokers are in place and the abdomen is insufflated, the pylorus is identified and 10 centimeters proximal to the pylorus is the approximate location of maximal concentration of the cells of Cajal. This is our target for the gastric stimulator leads. As you can see, the gastric stimulator leads consist of a proline stitch attached to both the ski needle and the electrode. Adjacent to the electrode is a, is a small silicone uh, but bolster that will allow us to sew the lead and secure it to the stomach. The ski needles are placed into the muscle layer of the stomach. A two centimeter tunnel is used and each lead is placed one centimeter apart. Once the leads are in place, excuse me, once the ski needles are in place and endoscopy is performed in order to confirm the placement of the ski needles in the correct layer of the stomach. The proper view of the stomach uh, should have no bulges and no penetration of the wall. The easiest way to do, accomplish this is have the assistant press on the leads on the outside of the stomach and visualize it from within the lumen. If you see no penetration of the wall, then they're in the right layer. Once the ski needles are confirmed, the leads are pulled into place into the muscle layer of the stomach. The distal end of the lead is then attached to the battery and the circuit is run. Uh, this is to assess for the resistance or the impedance of the system. If it's found to be greater than 800, this indicates that the leads are either too far apart, too deep, or have penetrating, penetrated through the mucosa and need to be readjusted. Once the, the system is confirmed using the uh, interrogator, the uh, leads are sutured into place. As you can see, the small silicone bolster is sutured on each side of the lead. The ski needle is then placed through a button and the proximal portion of the lead is then uh, secured on the other end. As I demonstrated before, the 10 centimeter Air seal port will then be extended to accom accommodate the battery. The pocket is made using bovi cautery on the fascia of the abdomen. If the patient, however, is obese, then a maximal depth of two centimeters is, um, is required for the interrogator to be able to communicate with the device. The, dev the device is sutured into place uh, using both of the anchor holes in order to prevent migration of the battery as well as uh, flipping up the battery within the pocket. Postoperatively, the battery is on and the system is uh, administering therapy. At six weeks post implant, the symptoms are again reevaluated. And if there is not 80% improvement of their symptoms, then the algorithm is followed to, in order to guide adjustments. Between uh, every six every six weeks and every three months, the patient returns and they have uh, the Nausea and vomiting is evaluated and the energy is increased if needed. Uh, if they reach one year and their improvement is less than 50%, then they become a candidate for the uh, robotic pyloroplasty. As indicated, the robotic pyloroplasty uh, is indicated for patients whose symptoms are not yet improved despite a year of adequate therapy or if they present initially with a greater than 35% retention on their gastric emptying study. Additionally, if they've previously responded to Botox. Botox is an excellent evaluator for response to pyloroplasty because it mimics the postoperative um, 
anatomy of the pyloroplasty. If the patient, however, doesn't respond to the therapy or if they have side effects, the benefit of Botox is that it's temporary. If it does work, it does indicate that the patients would likely respond also to pyloroplasty. Pyloroplasty is performed with the same trocar placement as the, as the gastric stimulator, especially if they're done at the same time. The patient is similarly placed in reverse Chandelenburg with the arms tucked. Uh, once the trocars are in place, an endoscopy is performed to identify the pylorus and inject it with methylene blue. This ensures that the pylorus is included in the enterotomy and that the enterotomy is located uh, evenly across the duodenum and the stomach. A longitudinal enterotomy with a transverse closure is performed. I perform a three centimeter enterotomy with a one layer V-lock full thickness closure followed by Evacel. Uh, Post-closure, a saline air leak test is performed with the EGD by filling the abdomen with saline solution, uh, placing the endoscope near the pyloroplasty and allowing air to traverse it and observing for bubbles. When I first began doing the pyloroplasty, I pulled the nation's gastroparesis surgeons and unfortunately I didn't find a consensus. Several did one versus two layer closures of their enterotomies. Some used permanent suture versus VLOC. Uh, a few did a gram patch or limber to the, the repair in order to protect the staple line. And one person did a five centimeter enterotomy. Postoperatively, I keep the patients in house for three days with NPO and IV fluids, as well as a nasogastric tube. After three days, a gastrograph and contrast study is performed in order to rule out leak. If there's no leak, the NG tube is removed and they're given a diet. And once they tolerate diet, they're able to be discharged. The next question you might be asking is gastric stimulator pyloroplasty or both? The gastric stimulator tends to improve nausea and vomiting by 68 to 87% versus emptying by 46%. Conversely, pyloroplasty improves symptoms by 30 to 40%. And of note, the primary symptom that it improves is fullness but gastric emptying is closer to a 60% improvement. So a group at a Temple University recommends that the following guidelines, if the primary symptom is nausea and vomiting and the retention is less than 35% at four hours, perform a gastric stimulator only. If the primary symptom is nausea and vomiting with greater than 35% retention, perform both the gastric stimulator and the pyloroplasty. If the primary symptom is not nausea and vomiting, then the options that I choose are to medically manage the patient, trial temporary stimulation, or trial pyloric Botox. When you're performing the gastric stimulator and the pyloroplasty together, I prefer this order of events. First, measure the, uh, identify the pylorus and measure 10 centimeters proximal and indicate this with a cautery mark. This prevents obliterating the pyloric landmark later in order to identify the lead the lead location later in the procedure. Next, perform the pyloroplasty, uh, followed by inserting the leads. Uh, at the same time, you can confirm the location of the leads and the competency of the pyloroplasty with endoscopy, and at that time, perform the air leak test. In conclusion, the gastric stimulator can be performed open laparoscopic or robotic for delayed gastric emptying with, in patients with primary symptom of nausea and vomiting. So, the pyloroplasty can then be added if the patient responds to Botox, has a greater than 35% retention on initial emptying study, or has had a year of submaximal symptom management with Enterra. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak, and feel free to contact me with further questions.